Hello, everyone. Today on The Final Bar, I'm talking with Ari Wald of Oppenheimer. We'll talk about some of the charts he is using to try and make sense of this market. The S&P pushing above 4,100 this week, just above 4,150. Is there staying power to this newfound rally? Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hey everyone, welcome to today's edition of The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a rainy Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the activity in the markets using the best practices of technical analysis. The technical toolkit is designed to help you make sense of markets when they are uncertain because you are focusing on the evidence the markets provide back to you. I was speaking earlier today to students at Babson College in the Boston area, so shout out to, uh, to those guys. And uh, what we were talking about is basically how the technical toolkit helps you understand by using price, breadth, sentiment, trend, momentum, understand how the markets are evolving, understand the history lessons of what has worked previously, and focus on the opportunities as defined by uh, the best practices of trend following and, uh, and momentum analysis. There's a lot to cover on a, on a closing bell show looking at the charts. We're going to do our best to review some of the top charts that we think are, uh, are worth putting in front of you. Before we get there, as we start our market recap, I do want to start with a poll. We always have a poll running on our live stream page at stockcharts.com, also on our social media accounts. So make sure you follow us on Twitter. Check out our YouTube channel as well. And we asked you recently, how often do you look at monthly charts? Every day, not every day, but a couple times a week, maybe a couple times a month or monthly I never look at them. So I'm, I'm very much concerned for the 9% of you that said never. I would strongly encourage you to change your tune and at least once a month, focus on what we learned month to month. I do a monthly chart review with my Market Misbehavior Premium members. We focus on how the world has changed. What did we learn from last month to this month? I would encourage you to do something along those lines to take a step away from what we call the flickering ticks, the day-to-day -day movements of the, uh, of the markets. I'm very happy uh, that about 68% of you basically say a couple times a month, a couple times a week, at least you're paying attention to them. Every day is maybe a little much, to be honest with you. I don't, I'm, I'm all on board with it if you think it helps you. But for me, I very focus, very much focus on the daily and the weekly charts. And then once a month, at least, take a step away, look at a series of monthly charts. Think about what we learned from uh, last month to, uh, to the current month. Whether Whatever you answered in there, I would encourage you to think about monthly chart, those different time frames, how they can help you understand what we call the fractal nature of market analysis, right? Different time frames have meaning. Let's continue with our market recap. Let's look at what happened through the course of the day today. You know, when I'm looking at the, uh, the, the movements in the major averages, kind of a spike early on, the rest of the day kind of settled into sort of a flat movement. And if you look, most of the averages were basically unch for the day. We're talking unchanged from yesterday's close. The S&P essentially flat up 0.1%, but it's just above 4,150, kind of similar with the Dow just below 34,000, the NASDAQ composite up around 12,150. Mid caps and then small caps underperforming. And the only big red numbers, two of them that I see on this, on this page, the first is the small cap ETF. That's the uh, S&P 600 index that we're looking at. Finished today down about a half a percent. The VIX moving lower as well. And what's interesting about the VIX is we're now below 17. We talked about how 20 is sort of a back of the envelope, general sort of basic level to decide or to determine whether or not the markets are sort of in a volatile range or a less volatile range, right? More volatility or less volatility. 20 for me has been the general measure, like is the VIX above or below 20? That's sort of the beginning of that, uh, that thought. We're now below 20 and we keep pushing lower and it's actually pushing lower uh, more and more this week starting to look a lot more like 2021, which was a, a slow and steady bull phase on much lower volatility with the VIX around the current levels that we're seeing now versus 2022 versus 2020, which were uh, years of much more elevated volatility. So we may be settling into sort of that nice and steady uptrend, but we'll have to let the markets uh, speak, speak for themselves along those lines. 
Interest rates, for the most part, moving lower, and that's from the uh, five-year point all the way to the long end of the curve. The short end uh, came up a little bit, but the long end uh, sort of coming down uh, just a bit, 20 basis points lower for uh, for the 10-year yield to uh, 357, we'll call it. Sorry, that's two basis points. I'm forgetting the uh, the decimal point there. Not too, not too much of a change uh, to where we're at uh, from where we were yesterday. Bond prices moving up just a touch, and the dollar index down a third of a percent from yesterday, but not too much of a uh, of a big difference. Commodities overall in the green, but again, not a big movement day. You see gold and silver prices up 0.4 to 0.6%. Same with copper prices. Crude oil prices came off uh, just a touch, but overall, again, this is sort of a, um, a light day, uh, which is fine. I'll take a, what we call a digestion day. You figure you have the big meal. Days like this are sort of the digestion where you take a step back and, and sort of process what we've learned up until now. All green on the top 10 cryptocurrencies that we track on the stock charts platform. Bitcoin up 2.6% today. We're at 30,210 or just uh, just above those levels. Ethereum continuing to push higher after breaking above uh, 2,000. So, you know, we'll, we'll look at a chart a little bit later. You think about gold prices, think about cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, Ether prices, how much of that is basically the inverse of the dollar movement, which overall has been weakening? Uh, I would argue a non-zero amount. That's a that's a significant uh, thing to pay attention to, certainly the interplay of these different asset classes. Let's look at a daily chart of the S&P next and just see where we're at relative to where we've been. So, you know, I would argue that the phase we're in right now is sort of we're at the upper end of this range, right? It's worth noting that the S&P right now is about where it was in March of 2022. So here we are 13 months later, and we're kind of right back where we started. This is when we talk about bottoms being a process and not a moment. This is the kind of chart that comes to mind, right? We, we may rally from here and, and continue to strengthen through the course of the year. I don't know if that's the case. I don't know if that's necessarily what I would assume is going to happen. But I will tell you that it's uh, that that a reversal from what we saw, the weakness in 2022 versus the strength that we've seen really since the October lows it's usually not a one-day thing or a one-week thing or even a one-month thing, right? It's a process. You see how much, how long it's taken to sort of process this, uh, you know, potential rotation here from a bearish phase to, you know, what is becoming more and more seeming like a bullish phase. We're, we're right at that point where I would argue we're looking for the follow-through, right? The S&P has now gotten above 4,100. Can it hold that? I think that would be the first question. Can it get above the February high around 4,200? We're seeing some stocks really get up to their August high and blow uh, right through them, blow higher. And I think that's what the S&P has not quite uh, been able to do, right? How constructive would that be if the S&P is able to get above its August highs from last year? That'd be pretty significant. And then, you know, when you think about what that would mean, right, if the S&P is up another 150 points, what stocks and groups and themes are doing well in that environment? Which ones are most likely struggling? What does that tell you most likely about the interest rate environment, about what the Fed is potentially going to be doing? All of these things are sort of uh, are sort of related. Now, so at this point, I would say we're sort of between 4,100, which was the most recent breakout level, 4,200, which is the peak from February. Which way do we break out of that uh, out of that potential range? You know, we haven't looked at the relative rotation graphs uh, in a little while, and I'm thinking of. Uh, our friend, fellow Stock Charts contributor, uh, Julius DeKempener, who hosts uh, his show, Sector Spotlight, on Stock Charts TV. I'm going to be seeing him next week in New York at the CMT uh, Symposium. I'll be seeing today's guest, Ari Wald, out there uh, as well. And uh, Julius will actually be coming back to uh, Seattle with us the week after. We'll have him in our office here in Redmond. Hope to do some really fun content with him uh, while he's in town. But uh, talking with him uh, earlier today, maybe think about just the RRG and updating on where we're at. It's interesting when you look at the weekly data on the relative rotation graph. And as a reminder, if you're not super familiar with this visualization, we're looking at the 11 S&P sectors and how they're rotating around the benchmark. The S&P 500 is basically at the zero line or the 100 lines, uh, sort of in the middle of the crosshairs. And then things tend to rotate in a clockwise direction. He created this visualization to you know, visually represent the sector rotation that market practitioners have been familiar with for decades, right, if not, uh, if not longer. But this is just a great visual way of showing how that rotation is evolving. There are three sectors out of the 11 that are currently in the leading quadrant, meaning on the weekly data, longer term data, they're showing strength relative to the other three sectors. And it's the growthy stuff, technology, communication services, and then consumer discretionary just getting into uh, the leading quadrant here uh, recently. What's interesting, though, is if you switch to daily data, which means instead of looking a little longer term, you know, weeks and months down the road or, or, or going back, you're actually looking a little more short term. Those sectors that I just mentioned are actually have rotated down, right? So here's the communication services sector down in the weakening quadrant. 
Here's the technology sector down in the weakening quadrant. Here's consumer discretionary actually in the lagging quadrant, heading southwest, what we might call the direction of deterioration. So how do you reconcile these two? The general way to think about it is the growthy stuff, the communication services, consumer discretionary technology, that has been the strength for the most part year to date, right? You've seen the strength in a number of those sectors, particularly communication services uh, in the new year, maybe uh, technology after that. But in the short term, you're seeing a bit more of a rotation. You're seeing financials bounce off of the lows. We're getting a lot of earnings uh, last Friday into this week, uh, starting to uh, you know maybe add some color behind this movement in financials, rallying after their uh, sell-off of the uh, during the the brief or uh, what what appears to be a very brief banking crisis recently, uh, recovering very very quickly. You're seeing the financial sector actually recover very nicely off of those lows. PPO and MACD, those sort of trend-following techniques have all given buy signals on the sector, and now it's rotating more in a, uh, in a position of strength. You're also seeing energy, healthcare, utilities all in the leading quadrant. So again, in the short term, you're seeing some of these other sectors actually start to participate uh, as well. I, I would argue that the bull thesis for me would involve a lot more participation, right? In improvements in breadth conditions and leadership names, right? More and more stocks making new 52-week highs and outside of some of those other sectors maybe uh, that we've seen uh, so far. I do want to mention within uh, some individual names, we don't have a lot of time to highlight them, but I just want to hit uh, a couple of these. You know, a couple of names that are actually struggling uh, a bit today. Johnson & Johnson is the first one that comes to mind. There are a bunch of earnings. We don't have time to go through all of them, but J&J &J is on the list this week. Down about 3% today, a little bit below that. What's interesting about the chart of Johnny John is we gapped higher. We rallied right up to the 200-day moving average, and that's been it. I don't know if we've actually even closed above the 200-day, so not by much, but we really have not followed through. I did a webcast earlier today talking about different phases when you see a technical signal and how follow-through is the important third phase, right? Do you validate a signal, right? When you hit resistance, do you trade through it? Can you validate or confirm it? by some sort of follow through. That's what we never really got on the chart of uh, Johnson & Johnson. Now we're rotating back uh, to the downside, almost closing the gap that we gapped higher at the, be, uh, at the beginning of April. So overall, seeing a bit of, a bit of weakness there. Also want to highlight uh, Dish Network. There are a bunch of others. Dish, Dish is one of those that was in the list of uh, bottom performers uh, today on the S&P 500. When people talk to me about buying new lows, and suggest that it's an easy practice. All you do is you find a stock making a new low, and that's probably a good one. I immediately think of charts like Dish Network, right? How many new lows do you see over the last year and a half to two years? And I would argue very, very many. How many new 52-week lows did we mint on this chart? For me, that is the, 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 the risk, or that is the danger of just buying new lows just because they're there. Find some ways to validate the ones that are showing improving characteristics and not just the ones that are down a lot. I think that's the way to avoid ugly charts that continue to underperform like Dish Network. Let's take a quick commercial break. We'll be back with today's guest, Ari Wald from Oppenheimer. We'll see you in a minute. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. We so appreciate you joining us every weekday after the close. We've got a lot of really cool plans for Stock Charts TV and this show, The Final Bar, in the new studio here in Redmond, Washington. A lot of good stuff to come. We are excited to uh, share it with you. A couple quick announcements before we bring on today's guest, Ari Wald. First off, we welcome your questions. We're going to do a mailbag segment on Friday's show. We'd love to feature one of your questions live on the air. Our email is thefinalbar at stockcharts.com. We're on Twitter at FinalBarSCTV. So just tag us in a comment there. On our YouTube channel, feel free to subscribe to it while you're looking, but also put a comment below the video you're watching. We'll hope to hear from you and answer one of your questions live on the air on Friday's show. Upcoming guests, just so you know what's coming up, we have a great guest today, Ari Wald, who's been on the show before, always brings some thought-provoking charts and uh, ideas with him. Tomorrow, we are going all CMTs, uh, all some of the best practitioners this week, in anticipation of the CMT 50th anniversary symposium next week. Tomorrow, we have Craig Johnson of Piper Sandler's, a former president of the CMT Association. Dan Russo of Potomac Funds will be coming back on the show Thursday on the 20th. Next week, we'll be heading to New York to uh, visit with many of our CMT colleagues. Tom Boley of Earnings Beats has agreed to guest host the show, and we will be coming to you live from the CMT Symposium next Friday, April 28th, which we're super excited to uh, finalize and give you all the details as soon as we're ready. I want to bring on today's guest, Ari Wald. There is the head of technical analysis at Oppenheimer coming to us from the New York area. Ari, great to see you. Welcome back to the show. Oh, thanks for having me back. As always, Dave, this is, I uh, love doing this one. 
So I uh, want to start with your chart thinking about, and again, we were talking before the show, just sort of uh, general objection handling, right? What, what are, what's the pushback that you're hearing on this market that just seems to continue to move higher, feeling more and more like it's in a bit of an acceptance phase going higher? Your first chart's looking at the S&P large cap versus small caps. What is this telling you? Yeah, this is addressing the recent weakness that we've seen, uh, you know, through the February March slide, uh, specifically the weakness in small caps and and even the Russell 1000 value benchmarks, which have a greater exposure uh, to the financial sector uh, as, as small caps do. And you know, our take is that the strength in large caps is the more important point that. Now, even looking at the Russell, and, and, and I get it, we want to see a market with broad-based internal breadth. The, the more stocks that are, are working and participating are, are typically the rallies that continue. So I'm not painting the picture this is necessarily a, a positive yet. You, you know, as we've kind of framed it, we're stuck between a bull and a bear and, and re- really just think it's a matter of time before we do break higher. And And looking at that weakness, how we're framing it, it's bent but not broken and and mm-hmm. thinking in terms of the russell 2000 it's still holding the lower end of its range it's still the base is still intact and on top of that what we found is that the russell 2000 has actually had mean reverting tendencies through time uh small the small cap index has actually shown stronger returns when it's trading below its 200 day average so there's typically more oscillations in small caps Versus, for instance, large caps, which tend to be more trend following. Uh, they, the S&P 500 has, has posted stronger returns while above its 200-day average. Uh, so for all these reasons, why we think S&P strength outweighs Russell weakness, why we think the strength in large caps should carry the rest of the market higher, you know, conversely, what would derail our view is there's a very fine line in the sand. If, if we see new cycle lows, for the Russell 2000, where the base doesn't hold, where we fall below even the Q4 lows, you know that's going to be um, indicating that perhaps our view that a market base is unfolding is not. Yeah, it's such an interesting point. I, I like the the comment about just looking at how the you know the Russell 2000 not participating is one thing. The Russell 2000 just going down, right, with those sort of names struggling, probably paints a different a different bit of a picture. Um, when you're looking at the S&P 500, it's hard to deny. I mean, the more I look at sort of the longer term chart, just th- this clear rotation from what had been a very painful 2022, starting in the fourth quarter of last year, really starting to improve. To you or for you, what about that? Um, what about that is encouraging? And I guess the other way to put about put it is when you're looking at the S&P itself, if the Russell breaking down would be a negative signal, what would you need to see from the S&P that would tell you, okay, this is not a recovery. This is now just some sort of short-term rally before we retest the lows or something crazy. Is there a signal? Is there a level that would cause you to, you know, I guess, take risk off the table or get a little more defensive? Sure. Well, we could start with uh, the removal of the positives. You know, looking back at last year, which was a very classic bear market cycle, it was broad-based selling in the first half of the year. And then the internal breadth picture started to improve uh, in the second half. And if we were to see that um, remove that uh, as much as we haven't seen the broad based breakaway, I, I would st- still s- argue that participation, I think, is healthier or stronger than a lot of bears give it credit for. And if that were to be removed, if we were to see this, you know, the the con- the, the, the opposite scenario where the Russell and value and financials drag everything lower, where if we were to see a breakdown in the Russell and then a breakdown in the Nasdaq as well, and, and I suppose. For the S&P 500, that 3,800 seems to be an important support level uh, over the more uh, near to intermediate term. Yeah, well said, Ari. Uh, your second chart, by the way, is looking at addressing, I guess, some, some other uh, sort of thoughts in terms of leadership. What do you make of the concentrated leadership, right? It's a small number of stocks getting it done. Talk us through your second chart. Yeah, that's uh, so we wanted to address this concern as well and, and kind of just represent that we put together a ratio of the NASDAQ 100 divided by the S&P 500 equal weight index, uh, which has been weaker of late. It shows this turn towards uh, these kind of large cap uh, tech heavy, the tech heavy index there. Uh, and how we see we do agree the tide has turned. The uh, leadership should continue 
to move towards the NASDAQ. On top of that, our point is that it's just getting started. Here's a ratio coming off a three-year relative low. If anything, I see this as a shift from what was bear market leadership to bull market leadership. And if Hmm. this does ultimately become a concentrated rally, and if there's going to be a point where we we reach a ceiling in the market, you know, our feel, again, looking at the S&P, looking at that ratio, looking at the NASDAQ, it's just starting. Let's see the concentrated, the the actual rally first. Uh, To us, it's still in its very infant, infant stages. It's one of my favorite things, pushbacks that I get is, you know, what, well, if you take technology communication services out of the picture, the market's not that good. My answer is you can't do that. Those stocks are working, right? They're going up and there's a lot of capital flowing into them as evidenced by the fact that the price is appreciating. Let's get to your last chart, if we could, Ari, uh, uh, talking about, uh, you know, uh, late stage selling as you describe it. Talk us through this one, if you could. Well, I think this is, this, this follows up on on everything we've just been talking about. and And I think it really, paints the picture that the the market has already reset and is due to start to curl higher here that the it's not concentrated buying that we've seen in recent months is actually late stage selling mm. let's separate those two uh benchmarks the nasdaq 100 and the s p equal weight it's this is the long-term monthly chart the, the ratio on top and then the components on the bottom is measured by a two-year rate of change so you have a, a nasdaq 100 that fell below 0% in the fourth quarter for the first time since 2010. The excesses have cleared in the NASDAQ. This was the worst performing two-year stretch for the NASDAQ since 2010. And now more recently, with the weakness that we're seeing in the rest of the market, it's simply last year's leaders now also falling below the 0% level. So this is just representing that equities broadly have reset over this two-year period and again, represents late stage selling, not concentrated buying, which I, again, I think is an indication of a market bottom rather than a market top. Some really interesting charts there. I'd love to ask you about a couple random things just to finish off our time together. You know, I, I feel like uh, we've talked about sort of the established technology, things like the Microsoft, Amazon or uh, Apple sort of trades, right, starting to work. I think there's this whole cohort of newer investors that think of a bull market as a time when you own emerging technology, things like the ARC Arc Innovation Fund types and names. Those have notably not been participating so much in this rally phase that we've seen. If you are constructive on the market going forward, is this an area where you potentially focus? And if not, what would you say is a better lever lever to pull than something like the uh, the ARC funds? No, that's such a great point here is that you know, there's uh, the Ari, we, we've gone through this whole reset just to see technology take on the same leadership role. And it's not the case. It's actually the uh, sector rotations within technology. What was innovation at one point and then was Internet and software and even Fang. It's not Fang anymore. You know, Apple and Microsoft have been much stronger than the other big names, um, Amazon, Tesla, um, e- even Netflix down after hours. And instead, it's been a move towards AI tech. It's not, yes, Apple and Microsoft are working, but it's really semiconductors that have, have where we're seeing a broadness of strength across the board, reversing higher, AI dominated one after another, a pro-cyclical industry that then through a February, March pullback was making new relative highs. That is just so telling in our view, especially when you see it across the board in the majority of stocks within that index, that, that, that is the charts telling a story. And I think that is the rotation in the sector and the new leadership that we're seeing. One more question then, if I, if I could. We've seen crude oil prices that you know, really haven't been, been doing much while other areas of the commodity space have been doing very, very well. Energy certainly was one of the top areas that a lot of us focused on, certainly the first half of last year when they did so well. When you see energy that had had a particularly good run, now sort of reset a little bit, do you see opportunity in those sort of areas to re-engage, or is it still sort of a wait-and-see mode, in your opinion? I think selectively, it's not going to be the same uh, value trade as we saw over the, the last two years, as much as it's not going to be the same growth trade. It's different drivers within that. And I think within energy, there are areas that look better than others. Refiners showing relative strength. I think you're keying on the stocks that have uh, had structural breaks at, breakouts above their 2014 and 2018 highs. And that's a key point. It's really stressing offense over defense here and that you can broaden out beyond technology you can buy pockets 
uh, commodities. I think metals and mining rank well in our work. You can look at home building stocks and restaurants and medical devices and some of the mid cap healthcare service names. Uh, so it, it paints a picture of you know more offensive areas are working while it's really consumer staples, telco, utilities, REITs, you know, more low volatility defensive that in our view have the sport the weakest relative charts. Uh, so for all those reasons, it's not going to be one sided growth. It's not going to be one sided value. I, I think there is a case to be made that they can work together. And that's really the secular bull market thesis for the long term. Imagine if Europe finally breaks through 30 year resistance. What if energy finally becomes an investable sector again? That the big divide between the two wasn't driven by outside returns and growth, uh, which we've argued the steadiness was somewhat underappreciated. It was how poorly value and the rest of that market has done. So if energy can finally start to participate and show some returns equal to tech. I think that's the, the long term bull market uh, story. When in doubt, let's focus on the price and see what's actually getting it done right, Ari. Listen, it's a pleasure to have you on the show, as always. Look forward to seeing you in uh, New York next week, and uh, be safe and be well. Dave, thank you so much. I'll see you then, and I'll talk to you next time. Bye now. That's Ari Wall. There is the uh, head of technical analysis at Oppenheimer. Boy, what a pleasure to have Ari on the show. And I, I miss having Ari come through our offices and get a chance to talk with some really knowledgeable, thoughtful professionals like, uh, like him. His charts looking at the NASDAQ 100 versus the equal weighted S&P. Really, what an interesting way of thinking about the narrow leadership and the tech sort of communications trade versus sort of the everything else trade and looking at that relationship. Thinking about the mean reversion that's at play and the upside opportunity. A great take there as always from Ari Wald at Oppenheimer. Folks, we're out of time. We gotta go to the three and three. Let's talk about three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. Here's chart number one. I liked Ari Wald's comments about uh, breadth. We didn't have a lot of breadth charts up as he was talking, but it did make me think of this first chart that I knew I'd be bringing up uh, as part of the three and three. This is looking at uh, cumulative advanced decline lines for the New York Stock Exchange, for the S&P large caps, mid caps, and small caps. Now, all four of these certainly moving higher in the last four weeks. But what's interesting to me is that we're uh, above the 50-day moving average on everything but small caps. And a number of these, particularly the S&P's breadth line, is actually testing a new high for the year, right up to those February highs. So as the S&P is testing 4,200, which is the February level, if it breaks that, maybe we go to the August 22 level around uh, 4,300. These advanced decline lines, I would argue, uh, it's really valuable if those can, or great confirmation if they can break out as well. And the S&P, the large cap advanced decline line, close to doing so uh, right about now. Chart number two in our three and three is looking at a little comparison of three different data series. We have gold, Bitcoin, and then the dollar, and the dollar's actually plotted upside down. And the reason why I wanted to show these three in this format is to show how closely they are related. When you think about the strength in gold, which again, over the last six months, hard to find a better uh, you know, uh, uptrend. You know, Maybe semiconductors, maybe some of the other areas we were just talking about uh, with Ari, but, uh, but overall gold has certainly been one of the better places. Gold stocks certainly uh, doing well with a number of them in the top 10 of our stock chart scooter rankings. Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies certainly showing strength. We talked about Bitcoin and Ether prices continuing to elevate, Bitcoin getting above that 30,000 level. How much of that is because the dollar has been weaker? And again, I'm plotting this upside down just to show how the weaker dollar gives space for things like gold, for cryptocurrencies, even risk assets like equities to appreciate, which means the bull case for stocks, in my argument, would say the dollar needs to keep weakening. The more that that happens, the more that's a great tailwind or the absence of a headwind for risk assets. Finally, home builders. I have a number of these uh, breaking out today. I'm looking at DR Horton, Pulte Horms, uh, another of them. There are a number of ETFs that focus on the space. The ITB is the one that I tend to, uh, to look at. We're now testing the February high, but what I like the most is a number of these have pulled that back to an ascending 50-day moving average and rotating to the upside. Look at how the momentum is remaining fairly strong. Good charts continuing to get better. Folks, that's a wrap for the show. I want to thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. Special thank you to Ari Wald of Oppenheimer joining us from New York. For Stock Charts in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Have a great night. See you tomorrow. Hey, guys. Dave Keller here with StockCharts.com. Thanks so much for watching our video. If you enjoyed it, and we hope you did, hit the like button right below. Also, we have so much new content every day. Consider subscribing to the channel. Just hit the subscribe button in the video or right below. Thanks for watching. Stay safe. Have a fantastic day.